Thank you for being here. How does it feel? I know uh, writing a book, talking to so many uh, authors, uh, it's such a, a, a massive project. So do you feel a, a little bit of weight off your shoulders right now? Must, must be like putting something out into the world, obviously a lot of time. I'm, I'm really excited that the book has hit shelves and uh, that I can that I can talk about it now. Uh, I, in your introduction, you brought up the uh, the community that All Tech is Human fosters. And I, I was thinking about the way that I am delighted that the responsible technology community exists now and that I am excited to be in a community with people because writing a book is a really solitary endeavor. Uh, I've been inside my head and inside these stories for a really long time, so it's thrilling to have them out into the world. That's why, uh, again, we're thrilled to have you here. But don't worry, we're not just going to start with all niceties. We got some hard-hitting questions. Bring it on. Uh, we, are, we are going to. Don't worry, don't worry. To make sure I don't screw them up, I do have my Tonight Show-esque <laughs> types of cue cards. Fabulous. Uh, but really, when you know, I got to read an advanced copy, so thank you for your publisher for sending that my way. Uh, really impressive, so I'm not surprised that it's already doing so well uh, out of the gate. Uh, one of the takeaways after, after reading More Than a Glitch, uh, the way I kind of took that phrase, right, is that the biases woven throughout tech perpetuate discrimination and inequities that lead to these significant harms in the real, real world that is not merely a, a glitch, it's more than a glitch. So set this up for everyone, right? The title, More Than a Glitch. Where did this come from? I know in the book you talk about some other individuals that you deeply respect, like Safiya Noble, Ruha Benjamin. Um, why More Than a Glitch? What are, you, what are you trying to convey with that? Well, the concept of a glitch is, uh, is that it's a blip. It's something temporary. Uh, and that it's easily fixed. And so one of the ideas I'm engaging with in the book is the idea that uh, when technology is racist or sexist or ableist, it's not just a blip that's easily fixed, it's something more systemic, it's more wide ranging, it's deeper. And so I engage with a lot of uh, really amazing journalism that's been done recently on uh, issues of you know, intersectional technology issues as well as a lot of the incredible scholarship. Uh, so you mentioned Safia Noble and Ruha Benjamin. Uh, they have absolutely been inspirations for me. Uh, and Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, was really a watershed moment for me. Uh, and I really admire Julia Angwin's investigative work at ProPublica and at The Markup, and just in general. Well, you, you heard in the introduction that Sandra from, from our team at All Tech is Human uh, did uh, mention the 2020 uh, documentary that you're in that's on Netflix, Code of Bias. Raise your hand if you've seen Code of Bias. If you didn't raise your hand, you should definitely see it. Great film with many of the individuals that Meredith mentioned. So obviously you also uh, listed a few kind of key books like Weapons of Math Destruction, which, which it's done really well. Uh, race after technology and, and, and others. Um, what what experience did you have after coded bias? Because I'm just kind of curious around the role that media plays in this overall kind of movement of getting more people to be involved, kind of in the social justice aspect. Because you mentioned at the top, Meredith, that. Uh, writing a book is a solitary type of uh, uh, experience, yet now there seems to be a buzz going on for a lot of the work that you're doing, especially in light of ChatGPT. And don't worry, I'm sure I have a question or two about that. But I'm just curious about your own experience with code bias and, and how you think that that has affected this overall uh, movement in space. So I am just thrilled that so many people have seen Coded Bias. Uh, Shalini Kantaya, the director, uh, was working on this, on this film for years and we happened to be at a dinner party together and we were seated next to each other. And uh, Shalini said, 
oh yeah, I'm, I'm making a film. I said, oh, what's the film about? She said, it's about racist robots. You know, it's kind of hard to talk about. And I was like, well, let me tell you something. And then we talked about racist robots for like two hours. And it was very exciting uh, to finally, you know, find somebody who was thinking about these kinds of things. Because back then, I mean, this was many years ago, so you didn't really go to cocktail parties and uh, or go to dinner parties and meet people who understood what you were talking about. Um, one of the reasons I got started in uh, this particular branch of tech journalism that I do, which is a kind of tech-infused immersion journalism, uh, is that I would go to parties and I would say, oh, I build AI for investigative reporting. And people would say, oh, you mean like you make robot reporters? And I would say, no, that sounds really cool, but that's not what I do. And I realized that we needed to uh, kind of have more conversations about AI, about its fundamentals, about what it does and doesn't do. Uh, and so that's what led me to uh, my last book, Artificial Unintelligence. Uh, and then this book came about because, uh, yeah, oh, I'm so glad you have a copy. <laughs> Um, after, uh, after Coded Bias and kind of as the conversation about responsible tech evolved, I realized I was having a lot of conversations about the intersection of technology and race, the intersection of technology and gender. Uh, and I realized I didn't know that much about the intersection of uh, technology and accessibility or technology and disability. That was something I had to learn a lot about in order to, uh, in order to write about it. Um, and so I'm just really pleased that we're having these kinds of conversations now because we couldn't have them, you know, five or ten years ago. Well, Meredith, since you mentioned it, I, you know, I know you have a whole uh, chapter kind of dedicated around kind of accessibility. And I know earlier I mentioned not about us without us, which is a popular phrase within that community of just talking about co-design and not kind of putting something on a community, but having that led from the bottom up from from the community. And you know, I was struck by your descriptions really talking about, uh, I think you're talking about a, a court case and, and, and just dealing with this idea of saying, well, wait a minute, is the online world different from the, the real world, right? We, we have this expectation in the real, real world to, to help out people of all different uh, abilities, uh, whereas it seems like online that can sometimes be in the in the background. So tell me a little bit more about your your thinking uh, and, and kind of your motivation in that in that space. Well, so like I said, this was the uh, this was the subject that I do the least about going into it. And I think you know, as a writer, it's important to recognize when you're not an expert in something. I mean, I know what I know, but like, there's a lot of stuff I do not know. So uh, I had to learn a lot, and I'm really grateful to uh, the folks who shared their wisdom with me and shared their stories with me. Uh, one of the things that we need to do a better job of in general is uh, listening to people with disabilities when they say, this is what I need in terms of accommodation. Uh, there isn't a one-size-fits-all approach to disability. Uh, and we need to design for accessibility, but then we also need to pay attention to what's needed contextually, what do individual people need. Um, so one of the things I've tried to do in the book is I've tried to lift up the voices of people who, you know, who have been thinking about these things for years. Uh, Alice Wong is somebody who I, I read a lot of her work and uh, she was really, uh, really influential in my thinking. Uh, there's a concept that stuck with me called a disability dongle. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this term. So the idea there is that a disability dongle is some kind of technological artifact that designers are really excited about, but is not really what's needed. So an example is a wheelchair that climbs stairs. Right? Like you might see a video of that and say, oh, that looks really cool. Like it's got kind of X-shaped wheels, and yeah, it goes up the stairs, and it's it's really neat. But if you ask most people uh, who use wheelchairs, they'll say, oh, well, that looks scary. It looks like I'm gonna fall out of that. Uh, I would actually rather have a ramp or an elevator because then, you know, we know that that works. 
right? So it's an example of why we need to uh, talk to affected communities before we start designing and assuming that the technology we create is going to be relevant to an affected community. And to follow up with that, why, why do you think oftentimes uh, technologists don't go out to these communities? Is it because they, the, you talk about techno chauvinism, uh, is it because they think they know more? Is it because they don't want to do the, the legwork? Is it because of uh, maybe uh, different levels of tech literacy and they think that is, is affecting it? Why, why would you say those communities are not typically brought in? Well, I think it's all of those things you just mentioned, right? I, I think about hackathons that I've done, and uh, at a hackathon, the idea is, okay, we're going to come up with something really quickly. There isn't a stage of talking to users built in to a hackathon. You just kind of come up with an idea, and then you make the thing, and then you know it's out in the world, and you know usually it evaporates afterward. Uh, but so we need to build in ethics review and responsible technology review into our design processes. Uh, we need to make sure that our designers are talking to affected communities, uh, that they are involving people at every level, uh, and that that's built into the business process. Uh, one of the uh, one of the sections in the book that if you are a corporate person, you will be very excited this is in there. If you are not a corporate person, you'll be like, what is she talking about with the business processes? Uh, but I found a diagram that was written by Salesforce, of all people. Salesforce actually has a pretty robust uh, ethical technology team or responsible tech team. And uh, Kathy Baxter at Salesforce had made this diagram that shows like ordinary business processes and there, then when you can insert an ethics review, right? So it's not just about doing it, it's about doing it inside business processes so it's repeated and so it's something that the business is focused on. If we can be uh, really topical, there was uh, news the other day, right, with uh, Microsoft, heavy investor in OpenAI, OpenAI, the creator of ChatGPT, now it's GPT-4. Uh, it seemed like they had laid off one of their ethical kind of AI teams, which obviously struck people uh, not in a positive way, uh, given the complexities around ChatGPT. So. Since I mentioned it and everybody's thinking about it, love to kind of hear your take on the ethical AI teams, which Kathy Baxter is, is heavily involved in, as you mentioned, but also just in general of, of how you think it leads into the current climate with, with people talking about chat GPT and generative uh, AI. So if I were in charge of Microsoft, I would not have laid off my, uh, my you know, <laughs> ethics and AI team, uh, especially not at this moment when uh, they really need to reckon with ethical issues uh, with ChatGPT. Um, have you all uh, been following the ChatGPT disasters, like the various people like finding, poking the holes in ChatGPT? Uh, which is great, right? Like that's what we want um, because you don't, uh, you can't think of everything. You can't think of every problem, and so you let something out into the world, and you ask people to play with it, and they find the holes, and you plug the holes. You know, OpenAI, to their credit, has done a reasonably good job of responding to, uh, you know, every time there's some kind of stir on social media about, oh yeah, ChatGPT is like generating text that seems like it's grooming a 13-year-old child for, you know, child predator. They're like, oh yeah, we, we gotta stop that. We gotta like plug that hole. So, you know, that's good. Uh, but I would have preferred for there to be more guardrails at the beginning. Uh, I would have preferred for there to be a more deliberate rollout. Uh, this way we're just, uh, you know, they're just unleashing the technology onto the world and saying, hey, go figure out what to do with this. And we have seen time and time again that there are lots of negative consequences to that. Well, that's the, the kind of follow-up question I like to, to add. One, uh, since I have your earlier book, right, Artificial Unintelligence, great read if you check that out as well. Uh, but it's a, a two-part question. Uh, the first part would be, what has changed since the release of your last book? And then two, uh, what's your hope with individuals who read more than a glitch? 
what were, were you hoping that they take away from this? So the first part was, what, what's, what's changed? I think one of the things that's changed is, uh, eternally, I think my own awareness of how to write about technology has evolved. Uh, one of the things that I did in artificial unintelligence is I had a whole chapter about code. You know, I, I showed people what it's like to write, uh, you know, to write code and to do machine learning. I felt really strongly that I wanted to do that because I, people talked about coding like it was this mysterious thing that like only very elevated people do, and I have a more democratic view of it. I think that you know it's just coding. It's kind of like it's like anything else, you can learn to do it. Uh, some people are good at it, some people are not good at it, but it's a, it's a skill, right? It's not a big mystery, it's not something done by wizards. Uh, and so I did that, I was really pleased with it, and then uh, it turns out it was really hard to read. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no code in this one. Uh, and uh, I am also uh, more aware of how difficult it is to write about complex technologies. Uh, it takes a lot of words to explain them, and you need to explain things multiple times before you can uh, before you can do it succinctly. Like, what's that quote about? I, I I wrote you a letter, and I'm sorry it's so long. I didn't have time to make it shorter. Like, I think about that, yeah, uh, I think about that one a lot. Yeah, yeah. so now the, the, the single part, you know, is, I guess one of, one of the things I was thinking about before our conversation today is, uh, with more than a glitch, who do you think is going to read this? But also, on the flip side, who do you think should be reading this? Because I think that's something I'm always kind of marveling at, right, is that, that sometimes, you know, we, we always know we can preach the choir, but then we're now trying to find the technologists who, to your point, are unleashing something into the world before we, we can adequately think about the considerations and the social impacts on groups that are oftentimes not at that proverbial table to make those design, development, and deployment decisions. Well, personally, I think everybody in the world should read this book. I know that there are 50 people in the room who have a copy. Hopefully, you will crack it open. You know, that is my that is my great hope. Uh, and I sometimes people will get in touch and they'll say, "Okay, how can I how can I learn more about getting involved in responsible technology?" You know, I'm really curious about AI. How can I learn more? Or, you know, I don't understand AI ethics and I really want to learn more and I kind of say, oh, well, hey, I got a book for you to read. Uh, it has, uh, it has been really a pleasant surprise that I, that the previous book was, uh, was read in a lot of different contexts. Um, so it has been read in information schools, it's been read um, by members of Congress, uh, it's been in AI ethics courses, uh, it has been, you know, uh, the subject of uh, corporate uh, corporate retreats. Like it's, it, I mean, as an author, there is absolutely no greater compliment than your book being out there and being uh, in different communities. So that's really what I hope for Glitch as well. Uh, I hope that it surprises you with some of the stories that you haven't heard before. Um, and I hope that it gives you new insight into stories you have heard before. Um, because as I said, one of the things I'm doing is lifting up some of the really great uh, journalism and scholarship that has been, uh, has been produced in the past couple of years. So you're probably familiar with the New York Times story uh, about the man in Detroit who was wrongfully arrested because of a facial recognition match. Uh, but maybe you haven't heard the story about uh, the man in New Jersey who had the same thing happen. Uh, and maybe you're kind of familiar with uh, predictive policing uh, being you know, less than successful, but maybe you haven't heard the story about uh, the man in Chicago who was identified by a predictive pol policing program as being at risk of being involved in a crime. So the police showed up at his door one day and said, uh, 
the software identified you as being you know, involved in a crime. We're not sure if you're gonna be involved as a perpetrator or as a victim, but the computer says you're gonna be involved. And the man said, well, go away. Like, I'm not, I'm not interested in, you know, in whatever you're, whatever you're saying here. But the police kept coming back. And they came back with social workers, they came back with neighbors, and they were parked outside his house. And eventually, he got a reputation in the neighborhood as being a snitch. And he was shot. Now, this is an example of a software program that is absolutely not working as intended because uh, like he was involved in this horrible, violent experience because he was targeted by a computer program and then the police like put him in danger. That's not what we want out of uh, out of software. No, it's definitely not what we want. Uh, so nearing uh, our kind of finish time together, and then we'll have lots of time if you want to talk to, to Meredith, uh, and especially those uh, who have the, the book, More Than a Glitch, and other people to, uh, to buy it on uh, Meredith's website. Uh, the second to last question uh, that really kind of dovetails with your, with your, your uh, story is I was really struck by power as a, as a theme. That's something I, I personally really always kind of view it through that lens as well. Uh, it seemed to be kind of woven throughout more than a glitch. Uh, one quote that I, I took from uh, your book is, we should not cede control of essential functions to those tech systems, nor should we claim that they are, quote, better or more innovative until and unless those technical systems work for every person regardless of skin color, class, age, gender, and ability. So we have a lot of people here who are part of this, right? Are part of this responsible tech movement, all different backgrounds, all across uh, the benefit of New York, all across the globe we have, we have people. What would you want to say to these individuals when you're viewing it through the lens of power? Because oftentimes, it can seem like people with power are making decisions around technology that are having dramatic impacts on people without power, and those individuals feel voiceless. So what would you, what would you say kind of around this, this topic of, of power? That is such a great question, thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad you picked up on that because I do think a lot about power. Uh, my great goal in, uh, in writing uh, you know, most of what I do about technologies, uh, my goal is empowerment. I want people to understand that these systems are not magical, that they are constructed by people. Uh, because once you understand how these systems work, you, are then empowered to push back when an algorithm makes a decision that's unfair. You know, when you are turned down for a mortgage by a mortgage approval algorithm, I, uh, you know, the the instinct might be to say, oh, well, you know, I must not qualify. There must be something wrong with me. I, uh, but I want people to understand that it's actually. Usually it's the algorithms that are unfair. Usually there is you know, some kind of long-standing financial discrimination issue embedded in the mortgage approval algorithm. Uh, and it's not you, the problem is the computer. And we need to push back when algorithmic decisions are made that are unfair. So I'm really excited about uh, a piece of uh, policy that's coming, uh, that has been proposed, it's called the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Uh, and one of the things that that says is that if you are uh, subject to a decision by an algorithm, you would have the right to uh, contest it. And you would have the right to a human being who is empowered to, you know, to believe you, basically, and to change it. Right. So I think that being able to understand our technological systems and push back against technological systems is a really important part of strengthening our democracy. Meredith, so I did have the uh, pleasure and privilege of interviewing you uh, last September uh, for Unfinished Live, uh, not too far away at The Shed. And that was before uh, more than a glitch, and uh, we had uh, you know uh, artificial unintelligence uh, on stage then uh, for our 
installation that we had. My question is, now this is our second time together. Let's imagine our third time. Our next time, two years, two or three years. When's the next book coming out, right? We'll bring another one. Let's say three years, right? We have your, your untitled book right now. We're bringing you back. What do you hope is different? What do you want to say three years from now that's, that's different? Where, where should we be in your ideal scenario? I would really like to not have to write books like this anymore. Uh, I would re <laughs> uh, I really hope that uh, in three years, we are not at a point of uh, raising awareness of racism, sexism, ableism embedded in technology. I hope we are at a point of finding, of having found solutions uh, and engaging widely in discussions about how to make our, our technology more responsible, more inclusive, uh, and more functional for everyone. Very well said. Let's give it up for Meredith Broussard. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Author of More Than a Glitch. Uh, so what we're going to do right now, we're just going to quickly bring on Laura, who's going to say a, a nice thank you. Oh, actually, no, you don't want to. You want to get right to it. So for everyone uh, who has a, a copy of More Than a Glitch, we're going to take a quick photo with uh, Meredith. If you want to kind of sit on stage, everyone with the, the book. But I also want to just thank each and all of you for, for being here today. We're here until 8.30. And as Sandra mentioned, this is actually the kickoff for our monthly series here at our friends uh, at Betaworks. Next one uh, on April 26th with Douglas Rushkoff, the uh, renowned media theorist, the best-selling author. And then we have one uh, May 31st, and then every month after that. So if you have ideas of who you'd like to follow in the footsteps of Meredith Broussard, do tell us. Again, one more round of applause for Meredith Broussard. More than Thank a glitch. You. And again, if Thank you, you have so the much. book, come up to the stage. We're going to take a photo.